Okay, I'd like to call the April 4th, 2022 recess council meeting to order. Uh, today is Tuesday, April 5th, 2022, 6 o'clock p.m. the Kitty Hawk Town Hall. Thank you, everybody that's here joining us tonight. Uh, tonight is dedicated to the beach renourishment presentation. So, Mr. Ken Wilson, would you like to start us off, please? Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Well, it's great to be with everybody tonight. And uh, when we're having these types of meetings, that means we're getting really close to the exciting stuff, the sea sand uh, being placed onto the beach. So tonight we're gonna walk through a presentation and uh, I mean, we can take questions from council or from the audience as things come up, um, but we'll give a little bit of a background. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the design. Some of these things will be just refreshers for others, folks that are watching on the internet. This might be the first time they've heard some of this stuff. And then we're going to walk through a, a series of construction photos from the last project just to help people understand what this thing's going to look like. Um, and that might get us into some questions. As questions come up, feel free to, to interrupt. And then we'll summarize things with a little bit of a schedule and, and where we go from here, how we're going to move forward. Um, so a brief introduction. Um, my name is Ken Wilson. I work for Coastal Protection Engineering, or cp and &E. Um, I'm, I'm based out of Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, I've been involved in this project as long as the town's been involved in the project back from the feasibility uh, portion of, of things back in 2013, 2014. Worked through all the permitting and the design for the first project. Um, have been involved in all the monitoring and the design of the second project and now looking forward to this, uh, this second project. Uh, also have with me here in the front row in the gray shirt, that's Adam Priest. He works for our firm as well with me down in Wilmington. He's the project engineer uh, for everything that we'll be talking about today. Um, two guys that are also down in Wilmington, um, they're probably going to tune in tomorrow or Thursday for the pre-con meeting, but um, two of our, our, our junior level guys, Sam Lohman and Frank Marshall, these guys um, work with Adam and I in Wilmington, and they'll be up here at, on the project site every single day. Um, they'll rotate back and forth, and then Adam and I will be up here on kind of a weekly or bi-weekly basis, uh, communicating with them very regularly, making sure everything is running smoothly. And then we, CPE will continue to be your eyes and ears in terms of this project. Uh, we'll, we will be dealing directly with the, uh, the dredge contractor on all these things. Um, we will we'll be setting up regular meetings. Every, every, the last time we went through this, every couple weeks there would be um, both um, a, a, a sort of an informal meeting with whatever town we're, we're working on at the time and the dredge contractors and our team. And then in the afternoon, typically we have a public meeting every two weeks. So people could come in if there were issues or questions or things that they're just starting to pay attention to the project. It was just a way of continually getting, getting that information out. But in terms of Weeks Marine, these are the contractors that are gonna, that are gonna do the, the, the project this go round. Uh, got James Ferguson in the uh, front row in the black shirt there. And then Joe Mazzarella uh, over here in the green shirt. Uh, so they'll help me answer some questions as well as we as we go along. Certainly, um, details about the equipment or, or how the project is going to be laid out, the construction. Those guys are are the experts. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, as most of you all know, the Kitty Hawk project is it is is obviously a big deal for the town, but it's also part of an even bigger project that includes Kill Double Hills and Southern Shores and the town of Duck. And as you can see in this image here. <coughs> um, Duck is kind of its own project separated just north of the field research facility and then there's a bit of a gap but um, this long extensive portion of all of Southern Shores, all of Kitty Hawk and about 2.7 miles of, of Kildable Hills makes up about one you know contiguous a uh, little, little over nine miles of, of beach there. So. Um, we like when we can string projects together like that. It actually benefits the performance of the project. Um, the longer a project is, um, sort of those end losses, the losses of sand that kind of drift off of the ends of the project, um, those sort of become reduced and the, and the projects perform a lot better when, we, when you have a long project like this. So um, that, that, that's good news. Um, a little bit of a, a additional background is whenever we get into these projects, uh, we talked a little bit with Southern Shores last night that you know everybody wants to know, well, do we do I need beach nourishment? Do we need beach nourishment? And that really goes to what you know, what are you trying to do? What are you what are you, what are you trying to accomplish with the placement of sand on on the beach? Now, 
You know, sand can protect from a certain size storm. Sand can be placed on the beach just to keep up with regular background erosion. Sand can be placed to keep, you know, floodwaters from coming over in certain, certain uh, storm events. So there are different reasons to design for this. But one of the things that I wanted to, wanted to show and drive home with this slide is that for Kitty Hawk, the beach nourishment goals have always been three, threefold. Um, the first was to reduce the vulnerability of public infrastructure, including NC-12, uh, town roads that were between NC-12 and U.S. Highway 158, as well as utilities uh, from storm-induced erosion, so erosion that happens during these storms. Number two was to reduce flooding in many of the non-oceanfront areas throughout the town. So water would come up over Highway 12, it would settle in that low area between Highway 12 and 158, and it would flood those neighborhoods from time to time. And so that was part of the beach nourishment was, can we reduce the number of times that those types of events occur? And then number three was reduce the vulnerability of the oceanfront homes uh, within the town that, that front the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Ocean. Obviously, whenever a storm comes up, um, those oceanfront houses are vulnerable. So those are always the three things that we keep in mind when we're starting to make recommendations or make, making design decisions, that these are the goals of the town of, Kilda, of Kitty Hawk's Beach Nourishment Project. All right, so let's talk a little bit about that, <coughs> that design. Uh, this is a graphic that we use all the time. Um, you guys have probably seen it quite a few times, but for the general public, it, it kind of helps drive home the basic concept of these beach nourishment projects. So here we've got sort of a typical cartoonish looking uh, profile where uh, the water's coming up pretty high. We've got this, this you know, generic house on the beach and a real small dune in front of that, uh, that, that house. So when we do beach nourishment, <coughs> we, we come in and we place uh, usually we're building a dune, we're also placing a very wide, flat, dry sand beach out in front of that dune, and then it slopes down to some you know, design, design slope until it meets the elevation in, in the water out here. But the, the, the active profile, the beach that we're trying to nourish, actually goes much further offshore. But the, 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 what, the, 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 uh, the thickness of that sand that we might want to place way out in 20 feet of water, we might only need this much more sand out in 20 feet of water. And as you go up, that wedge of sand gets thicker and thicker. But practically speaking, we can't ask these dredge contractors to go out there and surgically place you know, a couple of inches of sand in 20 feet of water. So the way that we do that is that all of that sand is designed. We know how much volume we need and we pile it up, they pile it up on the, on the upper part of the beach. And then over a period of time, sometimes as, as, as short as a couple of months, sometimes it might take up to a year, the wave forces will move a portion of this beach off, to the, uh, off into the offshore area. And that's all by design, that's supposed to happen. But what happens is people that aren't familiar with these project, um, you know, that are just casually observing things, they'll see this big wide beach, a storm will come, and that beach then is half the size that it was, and they'll say, we just wasted a ton of money. What, what happened? Well, what happened is what was designed to happen. That sand is supposed to go offshore uh, and re-nourish that offshore profile exactly like this. So once that equilibration process happens, that we piled that sand up, some of it has moved offshore, now we're left with really two types of sand. We're left with the, what, what's shown in those red arrows, the design beach. So this is a certain amount of volume that we've, we've determined is necessary to achieve those goals that we talked about on those first slides. So if we have that volume of sand indicated by these red arrows on the beach, we can achieve those goals that we set forth. But on day one, we have that protection. We don't want that protection to be decreasing as five years go by before the next project comes forward. So we take additional sand that is basically what we've anticipated might get eroded away over that five year period. And we put that additional sand out in front of that design so that, um, so that at the end of five years, we don't have the design minus five years of erosion. We still have the design in place, okay? So that's what these arrows are, are trying to depict here. Now in, <clears throat> in Kitty Hawk, you'll recall that the first time we built that project, we basically built a berm only, but we also created what we call the starter dune at, 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 um, in the initial construction. 
So what happened is as this advanced fill was going away over the five year period, this dune also built up pretty substantially because of sand fencing and because of some of the vegetation that was planted in that area. So, so now going into this next project, we have a much more substantial dune than we had before the first project. And when you get into this renourishment phase, really in theory, all you're placing is that additional advanced fill that you had lost previously. So if I go back, this would kind of be where we are right now. And all we have to do is place this advanced fill out in front of it. We don't have to reconstruct what was originally built in 2017. And that's why typically as these projects go along, after you've done the initial construction, these maintenance cycles are less expensive, less volume than the original construction of the project. Um, so that's what, that's what that's showing. These are a couple of profiles that uh, instead of kind of a cartoon, these are actual <coughs> cross sections from a, a project that was done a few years ago. But this shows the, the, in, in black the initial condition of the beach. And this red area was the design construction template, what we told the dredgers to go out there and build. So this yellow is what they actually built during the project. And over the course of <coughs> about a year and a half, this is how that profile, um, uh, profile equilibrated. So that's all of this sand that was placed there intentionally to move offshore. And you can actually see it in this profile comparison. And, and one of the reasons that's important is that, you know, you say, well, you know, I can't see it. That, that sand isn't providing me any kind of benefit. It's out there. You know, you engineers say this stuff, but does it really matter? Well, one of the things to keep in mind is that as waves move in from offshore, a wave can only get so close to shore before it actually breaks. And there's physics involved in, you know, the weight of the water can only stay in place to a certain depth, and then that wave will break. Well, the idea of this is that we're moving that break point even further offshore. So in this case, before the project went in, you would have a certain wave that would break this close to shore. But by moving this contour out, you know, 150, 200 feet offshore, now that same exact wave is breaking much further out away from the beach and you're, and you're dissipating that wave energy before it starts rolling up and, and chewing up your dune. And so that's kind of how these projects work. It's about tripping up and absorbing that wave energy, <coughs> moving that wave energy further offshore and trying to dissipate some of that. So uh, hopefully some of these graphics help drive, drive some of those points home. So in terms of the project design, and, and we'll keep those, those concepts, those general concepts that I just talked about in mind, the 2022 beach nourishment um, design consideration looked at three things primarily. There was a projected budget that right after the first project went in, we talked about the amount of advanced fill, so that sacrificial fill that we showed in the green arrows, what that number would probably be five years down the road. And the town used that number as, a, as sort of a planning tool as they went along. So there was always kind of a number that the towns were planning for for this 2022 project. And we wanted to, we wanted to do as best as we could with that budget uh, if the towns could absorb a little bit more, a little bit less, we work with the towns to try to deal with that. But the town's projected budget was certainly a consideration. The level of success of the project at achieving those project goals of reducing flooding from the overwash. So we looked at, did the project do what we said it was supposed to do? Or did we reduce the number of times there were overwash? And we considered that. And then we were also looking at, there's a lot of variability in the actual volume change rates that were measured over the last four or five years. So how fast is the sand moving off the beach? Well, in the first year, it, 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 you know, we lost a lot of sand, but after you know, two years, that kind of stabilized. And then in the third year, you know, we might've had a storm. So looking at that variability as we go on in time and trying to make some predictions about how much sand we may lose in the next five years, those were all design considerations. And so <clears throat> what this project is that's gonna go in place here in 2022, in total, it's about 750,000 cubic yards of sand that'll be spread along the entire town. But when we look at it, we look at it in a, in a couple of different ways. One, we're trying to maintain sort of the conditions as, as they are right now. That we, we feel like the, the beach as it is right now is doing a pretty good job of achieving that goal. And we can stick to the town's budget and place enough sand 
that we're basically placing that sacrificial sand out there again. Although the rate at which we believe that, that we may lose sand is a little higher than we had originally anticipated. So originally we designed for a loss rate of six cubic yards per linear foot per year. What we're actually measuring is about 30% higher than that. It's about 7.9 cubic yards per foot per year. So if you do all the math, we're placing the equivalent of eight cubic yards per foot per year times five years along the beach. And that's how you get to that 750,000. But when we do that, it's not evenly distributed along the entire beach, okay? There's some variability. And the best way of understanding that variability is one, we wanna look at all of the profiles right now and wherever, wherever we can look, remember that, that diagram that showed the red and the green arrows, there are some profiles where part of that red design fill is no longer in place. We've lost some of that design fill. So the very first thing we wanna do is go back and wherever there's a deficit, we're gonna fill in those gaps and make sure that we at least have that red design fill in place. The second thing we're gonna do is that there, um, there are two parts of the dune that were pretty, pretty heavily eroded. One of them is up at, uh, just south of Kitty Hawk Road, the sea, do sea dunes condo, that kind of scalloped out area in front of the, uh, the townhomes up there. So that's one area that we're gonna reestablish the dune. The other one is at the very southern end of the town. Um, that, that dune in, uh, along that, that uh, it's only a couple of hundred feet, about 800 feet, I think, at the very southern end of the town. That dune will also be reestablished because that starter dune is kind of no longer there. Um, and then there's, <clears throat> then there's some additional fill that through our modeling, we've determined that there are two areas in the town we believe erode at a higher rate than everything else. And we're preferentially placing some sand in those areas. Those areas are the southern 4,000 feet of the beach. Um, so that is, let me see, I think I wrote that down because so I knew I would forget that. Um, that's about where that scalloped out area is around the, the sea dunes, all the way to the south, to, to the Kill Devil Hills uh, town line. And then the other 4,000 foot stretch is up on the northern part of the project, not the very north, but it's about, um, 200 feet north of Fonk Street to 400 feet north of Eckner. So from Fonk to Eckner Street, that area, that area has held up pretty well during the last five years, but we've, some of our modeling and some of the, um, some of the, the, um, the monitoring that we've done just over the last year has shown that the rates are starting to speed up in those areas. And so those are two areas that we're placing a little bit of extra fill. And then if you take all that sand and you look at that, that 750,000 cubic yard amount that I talked about in the beginning, everything else is spread evenly. There's 19 cubic yards per linear foot that's spread evenly along the entire town. And so when you, when you put all that together, when you average all of that together, essentially when we build the, the, the project, when it's constructed, the beach will be about 80 feet wider than it is today. And so, unlike last time where we actually built up a dune, everything that's gonna be constructed except those two small areas where, where I'll talk about those dunes, for the most part, the entire project will be a flat sand beach built at an elevation of six feet. That's the same elevation that the, the flat sand beach was built in 2017. Um, for folks that are trying to figure out, how could I figure out, like? What does that look like, the plus six feet? We've been telling folks that if you go out onto the beach today and you found the wet dry line, that line in the sand that's kind of like the highest point where the water has washed up onto the beach and a lot of times it makes a sharp line down the beach, it's probably just a little bit further up on the beach than where that dry line is. That dry, wet dry line is typically around plus four. We're just a little bit further up the beach slope. But this, this project, in most areas is not gonna go all the way up to the dune. They're not gonna start construction right at the toe of the dune. There'll be a gap between the toe of the dune and where they will start building that flat platform out onto the beach. All right, so <clears throat> these are some of the construction drawings and this will help illustrate some of the things that I just went through. We can talk about some, beach, some uh, construction access and, and some of the dune designs and things like that. So we're starting at the southern end of the town. 
I mentioned that there were two areas where we're going to be reestablishing the dune. So I think this is the area that you're talking about where the where the post Pretty is sure. <laughs> is down here. We'll be careful uh, looking out for the post as it's um, as we're building that dune back for Thank sure. You. So um, there's about 530 feet of this dune. Part of it does go into Kill Double Hills. Part of it goes into Kitty Hawk. But we want to reestablish that because that starter dune really is is non-existent down there right now. But on any of these profiles where you where you look, you can see that there's that, that, that this gray bar, if you will, is kind of wide and then it gets narrow and then it gets wide. And so what these lines indicate is the the, the landward most line is essentially where they will start building out that dry flat sand beach that I just talked about. That corresponds, if you look over here, it says landward berm crest and there's an arrow. So that corresponds down here in this cross section to this point right here. So in this particular profile, there's no sand being placed on the dune and there's actually a, a gap between the toe of the dune and where they will actually begin construction. And then they're gonna build this flat sand berm and then it slopes down on a, on a, on a one on 15 slope down to wherever it will intersect the actual existing surface out there. So the, these lines that are on these maps, this would be the landward part of this flat sand berm. This middle line is the, is the outer portion of where that flat sand berm is. And then this outer bar represents the slope. So this is where we would anticipate that, that intersecting of the, of the beach. And that's, that's how you can kind of review these plans. If somebody was interested in a certain profile that their house was close to, they wanted to see how wide that beach was going to be, um, they could look at these plans and then they could look at the cross sections that's also included with the plans and kind of figure out how wide that is. Now I say that, but all of this was based on surveys that were done in the summer of 2021. Part of the construction contract is that in the next several weeks, maybe about a month, um, these guys are going to have their surveyors out here and they will resurvey the entire project at an even closer line spacing than what we're showing right here. And they'll provide us that data about five weeks in advance. And Adam and I and our team will go back and we will reestablish what, you know, what the, the, the distribution of the sand, if, if you will. So um, a lot of these beach projects, it's kind of like hitting moving goalposts as the, as the beach itself is changing out there. We're adapting these plans to make sure that, you know, we always tell people we're, we, are, we are trying to provide equal protection along the project area. We're not necessarily providing equal sand. Not everybody's getting the same volume, but we're trying to establish the same protection. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to be working through that process. Um, so this is still that area down at the south, just showing kind of a, a zoomed in cross section where this, this project or this, this profile in particular does include um, the rehab of this dune right here. So that's what this is showing, a little bit of, a little bit of sand actually being placed up in that dune. But as we move away from that dune, now we're moving further to the north. So we've tried to highlight in red some of the landmarks. So this would be White Street. Um, and this is getting up into those townhomes that I talked about. This is that other stretch of dune where, where the scalloped out area, if you go in there, that, that hot spot that's eroding pretty good where the, the dunes that were there before that weren't even part of the 2017 project, some of that has been eroded away. So that dune will be rebuilt along that 800 foot section. Uh, as we go a little bit more, oh, this is just another cross section that's showing that there actually is a dune uh, being built along that particular cross section. These are the, these are the uh, townhomes that we talked about. And then this is getting into the bathhouse parking area right here. So the next, the next uh, plan view moving forward, um, this area here has is, is been marked and permitted as a staging area and access point. Um, the guys can talk a little bit more about the, the likelihood of using that. Um, we, in our discussions, we're anticipating that the use of all these staging and access areas will be pretty typical of what you saw last go round. That there may be parts of the project where they need to bring in equipment or take off equipment. And during those times, they may close some of those accesses that they, that they have permission to use. Uh, for a period of you know 24, 48, you know 72 hours, something like that. But for the most part, you know for the majority of the summer, we would expect those parking lots to be open. 
Um, they've also talked to, to us a lot about um, maybe in addition to some of these areas, just trying to identify some areas where their crews can park um, just you know, on a daily rate when they come in for their shift, making sure we've got some spots where, um, where, the, where their trucks can park and so forth. And also in between some of these accesses, sometimes it's helpful that if they have fuel deliveries coming in, um, they'll have fuel tanks that, are, that, that can be drug up and up back and forth along the beach, uh, but they may need to find an access so that they can drag their fuel tank up and make sure that you know, a fuel truck could get close enough to that access. But those are more like deliveries that you know, would, would take an hour or two or something like that. Um, not a place that we're looking at closing down something for a long extended period of time. So moving back up north um, through, this is Historic Street, um, getting up to the, the northern portion here. Let's see, this all kind of just follows the same pattern. And then up at the northern area, we do have a couple of uh, additional staging and construction accesses. So um, they've, got, uh, they've got permission to use half of that parking lot again uh, as needed as a, as a staging area if they, if they do need that. And then they're, they're also allowed to use for construction access, um, the Bird Street access, and, the, uh, and this would be right on the other side of the pier that they could come in through the, the Hilton Garden Inn um, property as well, which would, which would help them clear the pier if they, if, they, if they can't get everything underneath of the pier. So on both sides of, of the project, the Southern Shore side and the Kill Double Hill side, obviously because your neighbors both to the north and the south are building one of these projects, there is no tapering into the other town. However, one of the things that we've shown here is that there is a little, little bit of a gap between how, how much fill is being placed in Southern or in Kill Double Hills versus how much fill is needed to achieve the design in Southern Shores. If there is an area like that where there's a little bit of a stair step in here, what we'll, what we'll do is we'll work with the, the, the construction folks and figure out how long of a transition they might want. Sometimes we make that two or 300 feet long and we'll just kind of smooth that out. So there wouldn't be a, you know, oh, you got the beach out to here and then all of a sudden it cuts in and you know, there's no sharp edges. Everything's kind of transition. All right. Um, again, each one of these cross sections correlates to a profile that are on those maps and I just put it up here to help folks that, that might want to dig into this a little bit better to understand um, that they can kind of figure out the, the width of you know the, the, the fill at any given station. All right. Um, so real briefly talk a little bit about the borrow area. Um, so the, we're using the same borrow site that was used uh, for the Kitty Hawk project in 2017. That borrow site is if you're trying to go straight offshore from Kill Double Hills or the northern part of Nags Head you'd have to run about five to six and a half miles offshore to get into where that borrow site is. Um, it's got about, it, it, we, I'll show you the, well, you can see the, the shape down here, but I'll show you a better image of that. Within the confines of that area, there's about 12 or 13 million cubic yards of sand. Um, the entire project needs less than 3 million cubic yards for all the town. So plenty of sand in the borrow area to use. Um, and it's in about 50 or 60 feet of water. If you went out there and ran a, 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 a you know, fathometer, a fish finder over it, um, it, it varies between 50 and 60 feet. One of the things that we talked about with some of the other folks is that the, the area that they're dredging out there is not a flat area and they're not digging a hole into a flat area. The area is more of like a, a hump. It's a shoal out there and they're sort of shaving down the top of that shoal bringing it down a little bit. So the sand deposit is actually, it's, it's actually a, a hill or a shoal out there that they'll be targeting. Um, and I'll show you a cross section of what that looks like. You can kind of see it a little bit in, in this graphic here. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is just showing some of the analysis that goes into it. So we've got core samples of all of the sand that'll be dredged up. Again, you know, it's the same sand that was used in the, in the previous project or the same source that was used previously. Lots of analysis that goes in there, lots of surveying of these areas, looking at what the seafloor looks like out there, looking at the different layers of sediment below the seafloor, um, and all that helps us make sure that the sand is compatible with the, the actual beaches that we're going to be placing it on. So this is a, a detailed drawing of that borrow site that I was just talking about. And a couple things to point out, I'll show you just a, cro a cross section of the borrow area on the very next slide and those cross sections run along these red lines. But uh, I'll point you uh, to these bolded numbers and these arrows. 
So every one of these sub boxes, <clears throat> they have permission to dredge to a different depth. Um, so that seems a little bit complicated. When you look at that, the shape of that site and then you look at the different cuts, you're like, you know, why is this so complicated? Why can't they just go out there and dig? Well, we have a certain amount of information of that borrow area. We have a certain amount of area that's actually been surveyed the way it needs to be to get permits for this. And so, you know, you are, you are limited to some extent in terms of, you know, budgets for these sand resource investigations, how many cores you can take in this. And when we, when we use, when we take all of the data that's been collected and we try to maximize the amount of sand that we can get out of that area that we've, that we've identified, you end up with, you know, a, a shape that looks like this. Uh, and, and different cuts and things like that. So there's some art that goes into this because we know that we can't design this to be so complex that um, you know these guys can't turn their dredges on a dime and they can't bring up the elevation of the of the um, the suction you know, the, the suction heads and things like that on the dredge on a, on you know at a at a moment's notice. So um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of effort that goes into this to try to maximize how much sand they can actually get out of the borrow area. But it is it is a little bit complicated, and this this cross section kind of shows some of the stepping up of different areas. Um, and what we typically try to do is try to make those boxes big enough that you know these guys with these big ships can actually sail through and, and you know they only have to run through on one track and pick up that sand as opposed to having to make a whole bunch of zigzags back and forth try to keep the operation as as efficient as possible but again you can kind of see the the you know the the profile out there if you were to go out there and run a fish finder out there it's a it's a series of these shoals out there and again this is after the the the, the, the borrow site had been dredged back in 2017 as well um, all right so let's move into some uh, some of the construction photos um, as I mentioned all these photos are projects that were taken from different parts of the 2017 project. So one of the first things that, that you're likely to see on the beach, other than you know, trucks arriving and starting to unload pipe and unloading uh, heavy equipment, is the installation of what they call the submerged shore pipe. So all of these projects will be done with a hopper dredge. That will be um, you know, a, a large ship that can suck that sand up, store it inside of the, of the ship, and then they'll sail it towards the beach and hook up to one of these sublines. And so there's a, there's a point offshore where the, the, the boats can hook up into, and then the pumps on the boat actually pump that sand and water mixture up through a pipe that would be laying on the seafloor bottom, and it would come up through a pipe looking like this. But this is just, this is the type of equipment they use to get that pipe in place out in the water, and this is what it looks like when they actually land those pipes and try to bring them up onto the beach. And so the first couple of days of pumping, when they reestablish one of these sublines, might look a little bit something like this. This is a picture of from Duck. But really all they're doing here is they're trying to build up enough of a flat sand beach that they can move their construction equipment into it. And then they'll start to turn that pipe either north or south and continue to build. So this is an area where they've already built their platform up. You can still see that subline going out into the water. Uh, but they've now made that turn and they've got all of their equipment inside of this area. And so <clears throat> one of the things to look at here is you can see this orange fence in the, in the background here. This would be the barrier to keep people out of the active construction area. Everything south of here, uh, or yeah, south of here would be in the construction area. And then there's probably another fence just off of this picture somewhere down in here that's keeping people from coming up from, from the south. And so this is the area that the, all of their equipment is operating in, that they're closing off to any pedestrians, um, but, but folks can certainly be to the north and to the south of this area. Um, this is another good, good uh, active construction area photo, just kind of um, showing, you know, diagramming some of the different areas. They've got a couple of valves up here so that they can pump in different parts of the, the fill and just continue to evenly distribute that sand as they move south. Um, this is showing that fence from that last picture where that the end of that construction zone was. Uh, let's see, as we're moving forward, just a couple of other construction photos. This is kind of a, a neat video that we had taken with the dredge or with the with the drone last time, kind of showing what that operation were to look like um, as that sand and and water mix is coming out of that pipe. Uh, all these bulldozers are starting to stack that sand up as the water's flowing back into the 
into the ocean. And, and this would be that flat sand beach that we talked about. So this has already been built, it's probably already been surveyed in, but this, would, this is what, what, will, what it will look like when that project is initially constructed, a very flat, a very wide, dry sand beach. All right, um, this is just some of the equipment that you might see inside of the construction area. Um, you know, lots of pipe. They're constantly adding pipe onto to these lines to extend down. Uh, but water tanks and, and uh, you know, light, <coughs> uh, light stations, uh, fuel tanks, these Connex boxes where they've got, um, you know, their offices set up in there, uh, port johns and, and heavy equipment. That's the type of stuff that would be inside the construction area. Um, one of the things that we've talked with uh, to some of the other towns as well is that <coughs> in, for that 2017 project, one of the things we were able to do because most of the projects included the construction of a dune was that we were able to kind of keep a barrier on the landward side of the construction area so that even though folks that might be renting these houses right here could not walk straight out onto the beach, they could come up their walkover and at least feel like they were on the beach. They could see the ocean and then they could walk either north or south along that barrier to get to a point where they could actually get out onto the beach and, and hang out. Um, you know, the, the di different parts of the beach, you know, they, the, the, the contractors may or may not be able to do something like that. Um, certainly one of the primary concerns is safety. We don't want to move these boundaries in so close to that equipment that you know, a kid goes under the fence or, you know, somebody gets through something like that, that, that would be the worst case scenario. But we also understand that this is the summertime, this is tourist season. We want to try to minimize the inconveniences as much as possible. So no guarantees made, but, you know, certainly these guys are used to doing this type of work uh, in the summertime in tourist areas like the Outer Banks. And, you know, they want to accommodate as much as possible, but safety is definitely going to be, you know, of the, of the utmost um, consideration. Um, so these are a couple of the, or the three dredges um, that, that, that Weeks has talked about bringing to the project. Um, I don't know, James, you want to talk a little bit about um, the, dr the dredges real quick? Sure, yeah, the, the two uh, dredges on the bottom, you'll probably see first. They're, uh, they're smaller dredges, 4,000 cubic yard capacity. Um, you'll get something less than that actually in a load at any time. And by the time we're done with Kitty Hawk, you may actually see the Magdalene replace one of those dredges. Um, we plan on doing that at some point during the project. So you'll probably see a combination of all three. If that doesn't happen at Kitty Hawk, you may see it around while we're doing another portion of the beach uh, to the north of the All right. Um, so for folks that, that you know, are less familiar with these projects, as I mentioned, when the, when the dredge comes in, it's been in that area that's in 50 or 60 feet of water, you know, five and a half, six miles out into the ocean, fills its hopper up with sand, brings it in close to shore, and hooks up to those sublines. This is kind of what it would look like from the perspective of the beach. Those, those ships are going to be, you know, bigger ships that people are used to seeing right offshore. Um, you know, they're not going to be so close that people will be able to swim up to them or anything like that. Um, but they'll, they'll be, you know, they'll be pretty close to shore and that's, that's about the perspective that you'll have when they're, when they're actually pumping out uh, that sand onto the beach. Um, this is another image uh, from the drone just kind of showing what those, those ships look like out there hooked up. So this is a floating pipeline. This is connected to the front of, the front of this particular dredge but it's pumping that, that slurry sand mixture to this point where it goes down on the bottom and then it, it goes through that subline all the way up to the ocean or all the way up to the, to the beach uh, where, where you'd see the sand coming out. And then this is the actual sand inside the hopper that's getting uh, re-slurried mixed with the water. All right. Um, so in order to, to not impede access, um, certainly they, they've got in their contract that every so, every so distance they have to um, construct these sand ramps to make sure that folks can, can easily get up and over those, um, those pipes. So this is an area here where the subline is actually down in this, in this location. You can't see it out in the water, but it's coming up on the beach somewhere around here. And then it turns and makes, uh, makes a, a, a run to the north. Well, they've, they had con, con finished constructing this area and the, and the boundary fences continued to move north in this particular area of Kill Double Hills. So even though that pipe is laying out there on the beach and sand and water running through that pipe, 
it doesn't restrict access. They don't have to close every, every place where the pipe is located. They're just keeping that area, that active construction area, uh, closed. And so that's kind of what this is showing here. Um, I had shown earlier that, that kind of average building that flat sand beach out about 80 feet on average. Um, but what I wanted, the reason I put that, that picture back in there, I wanted you to kind of think about that frame of mind. So this is a picture from Kitty Hawk. Uh, I think it's from this past winter. Um, but you know, pretty, pretty basic picture. So if I was to guess where that plus six foot contour is, it's kind of around where this black line is. I've just kind of you know, hand drawn that on this map to show. But in this particular area, they would begin to build that dry flat sand beach from this line out seaward approximately 80 feet. So from this line, you'd be able to walk out on flat, dry sand about 80 feet, and then it would start to slope down to the water when these guys are done finishing the construction of the project. So that just gives a little bit of perspective. Um, one of the other aspects of this project is that part of uh, Weeks Marine's contract is um, to install sand fencing. Now the permit would require that the sand fencing be within 10 feet of the toe of the dune, but <clears throat> we've, got some, we've got some discretion as to where um, you could get the most bang for the buck in terms of where to place that sand out there. So probably sometime uh, in the next couple of, um, you know, couple of weeks, we probably want to uh, maybe ride the beach with Willie and, and uh, you know, some other town staff and talk a little bit about you know, their experience with putting in the sand fencing and you know, where they're getting the most bang for the buck. Do you put it on top of the existing starter dune to try to build that elevation higher? Um, you could potentially put it landward of the starter dune in some of those areas where it's, uh, there's a little bit of a dip. Uh, in this particular area, there's a little bit of a dip right in here. We could potentially put that sand fencing back here to try to catch any of that sand that makes it over there, or you could put it out here right on the front of the dune. Certainly, we don't, we don't want to start encroaching this dune further and further offshore because we do know that in the winter time, we're going to have high water events where that water will make it up to the dune. And the further we can move that dune back on the beach, the longer that dune will stay in place. So we can talk a little bit more about the strategy of where particularly we want to place the sand fencing. And then we just have to provide some direction to, uh, to the contractors in terms of when they're done placing the sand, what's the alignment that we're looking for. All right. Um, I've been talking a lot. Does, any, does anybody have any questions so far? Um, any of those pictures or folks in the audience? Um, happy to take any, any questions. Ken, I've got a question. We dealt with this in 2017. If, if you've got a, an existing home, a cottage, that is sitting seaward of the existing dune. So we had a, we had a question before, and you know exactly what I'm talking sure. about, I think. When you get, when you're pumping sand and you're leveling the sand, do you go under that home? Do you go around it, leave a gap? Explain to the public what you do there. Sure, so um, their, their specifications specifically would, I believe it's 10 feet, would prohibit them from getting within 10 feet of a structure, of a piling, of a deck, of anything like that. So they, they as the construction contractor, don't, don't need to get any closer than, than 10 feet to a structure. We, even if the design says place it there, we don't require them to go any closer. If a particular homeowner wanted um, them to go closer and was willing to sign a hold har harmless agreement, we did do a lot of that because we were building dunes in Duck and Kildable Hills and even in Kitty Hawk during the last project. And there were places where um, the contractor you know, could get much closer than that around walkovers and not so much pilings going to somebody's house, but certainly walkovers and things like that. We executed a lot of uh, hold harmless agreements, which basically said, hey, if, you know, if, if, I, if I knock out this railing on these stairs here, like you asked me to push the sand up as far as I could and you know, sorry, sorry I broke it. Um, you know, but most of the time these guys are good enough not to, you know, not to make that happen. So in terms of the house that you're talking about, I would say probably what's going to happen is they're going to build what they're designed to build up to, you know, within 10 feet of that house. 
If that particular homeowner wants to do something a little bit different, we can certainly communicate that to the contractor um, and see if you know see if they want to do something a little bit different in that that particular location. But the last time I think because that starter dune, we had to get sand much further up and and even like behind or around the sides of that that particular structure. Whereas this time, depending on where that plus six foot contour is, um, there's probably not going to be any sand placed, you know, behind that that structure at this point in time. Um, but the the front of the, the seaward side of those pilings, you know, that might be right in the area where it's where the flat sand beach kind of ties into it. Um, so the all of the those types of individual um, locations, those are things where when these guys come in and lay their project out on literally 100 foot line spacings along the beach, um, they'll, their surveyors will go out there and collect that data. They're, they're required to collect it no sooner than seven days before they're going to place sand, but they have to provide us the data within three days of placing the sand. So, so what, what typically would happen is the day the surveyors are going to go out there and look at those lines at that house, They'll contact our rep, our field rep, and they'll, we'll go out and look at it specifically to see where those lines are, and they'll kind of like field adjust to figure out, okay, well, here's the six foot contour today. You know, there's not really a reason to go out and look at it today, like, like right now, but three or four days before they're actually gonna place the sand, that's something that we can kind of figure out how, that, how that's gonna look at the time. Good, thank you. Sure. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I've got a couple questions if you don't mind. Um, for some of the last projects, there was someone on site there to answer questions, and I think kind of like make sure that the boundaries were being you know, you know was going into the construction area. Would you plan to have someone on site like that for this next project? So that's a James question. So what he's talking about is like on the north and south end of the sand fence or of the boundaries, mm -hmm. they had you know somebody basically stationed there. You know, <coughs> For, at least during the daytime hours, for sure. Um, that if people, you know, people would come up to them and you know ask them questions and things like that. I mean, it wasn't required that they just got used to answering the same questions over and over, so they kind of knew what was going on. But in terms of like somebody there kind of monitoring the boundaries, well, um, we will have people monitoring the boundaries. Certainly, you know, security keeping, you know, helping to keep out of the, the construction area. Um, generally speaking, I would say. That they don't answer questions. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would advise, yeah. generally speaking. Um, obviously, that doesn't you know, always happen when you're, when you're talking to people out there. You know, and, they, and they get the feel for it. There are probably not going to be people who work with us all the time and they're very in tune with what's happening with the project. So it's probably not a great spot to get info. <laughs> I mean, I would. I would. That's a good thing that people enjoyed. People commented that that was very positive. Yes, I do remember that. And I know there was, I'm just saying, all the vacationers, you know, like, yeah, what's going on here? What, what are y'all doing? We won't have, I, mean, I don't plan on having someone that's you know, out there to answer questions necessarily. I mean, they'll be out there to provide security to the project. Mm -hmm. uh, we can answer any questions either between us or the you know, staff will be out there as well. Sure. Yeah, certainly happy to do that. The, the guys that we hired to do that won't be there to answer questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Specifically. Gotcha. And it sounds like you said there will be a, a, a walking area behind the project. So in the gym and the right. What uh, what we're saying is that we, we wouldn't commit to there will always be that. Like we, we just talked to Killa a little bit earlier today about it. And I mean it, it's really going to depend on what the beach looks like at that time as to whether it's you know there's enough room to safely allow for that passage behind. Um, like I said, it, it, it's one of those things that until they get set up and you know, they're at a particular area of the beach and, you know, they can kind of see the widths and the space that they have to deal with, you know, they're, they're, they're do their best to accommodate for sure. And since it is a re project, do you expect the project to move faster than it did? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Pro probably slightly faster. I would say that the fill densities are less than they were previously per linear foot. So. Uh, I, I want to say that this project is probably around 60, 50, 60 cubic yards per linear foot, and the 2017 project was probably closer to 90 cubic okay. yards a linear foot. So when you think about it in, in terms of that, you could say yes, but the equipment is all a little bit different as well. Um, you know, I think 
I think in 2017 in Kildall Hills and probably part of Kitty Hawk, um, the other contractor was using one big dredge to work off of one line and two smaller dredges to work off of a different line. So there were actually like the, the construction site that I showed, there were actually like two of those going on at the same time in Kitty Hawk and in Kildall Hills at different times. Um, whereas these guys, um, the way that they've kind of laid out the project right now and based on the other backlog work that they already have on their contract, I think what we've talked about is most of the time they're probably going to work off of one pipeline. So the fill densities are a little less and, and you know, if they're really running well, then one crew can probably move through a section, which would keep the closures down, you know, you know shorter periods of time. But um, yeah, in terms of the volume, that, that's a good assumption. But uh, yeah, the equipment is also different. And in terms of the staging area and sublines, do you have those set in stone yet, or is that all subject to change? And when you do have those, you know, more finalized, is there somewhere that, that we can see them? Yes. More? Yeah. So the the first part, are they set in stone yet? No. Um, we've gotten some drafts from them, and we're still kind of talking about talking through. Um, these guys will, will be up here on site for the next week or so, still trying to lay things out, figure out exactly what will work you know, the best for, for, for their equipment and their crews. Uh, but as soon as we have what we, you know, nothing set in stone, but as soon as we have something that we're pretty comfortable with, that's the type of information that we, we're aware that, you know, the public, the towns, the county are going to want to try to get out there and you know, let people know where those you know, landing areas are or, you know, what, at what point in time um, or at what point in time might the staging area, access area, be closed for you know a couple days while we while they mobilize their equipment? So for right. sure. And then I got one more question. Sure. Um, in terms of the borrow area, I, I've heard that they're like running out of sand out there. Is that true, or is that just so that particular that particular borrow site? We would not expect it to recharge itself. Like sand is filling in where they're dredging as fast as they're taking sand out of it every four or five years. Um, so it, in, that, in that essence, it is a finite resource. Like at some point in time, it will run out. Um, the, the, we've got data that kind of go, remember I said, you need a certain number of cores and a certain amount of survey data to be able to actually draw that shape and get it permitted. Well, we have all of that data for that particular area, but we also have some data that goes a little bit beyond it. So there are probably areas to the north of that borrow site that we could expand. We haven't done like good volume calculations of how much volume it is, but probably sometime between when this project is done and going into the next project, there'll probably be some discussions about additional investigations, uh, especially if Southern Shores and Duck continue to participate. Um, you know, it, it, it would be advantageous for them to have a site that was further to the north. For the 2017 project, there was a small borrow site that was right offshore of Duck, but we pretty much used all the sand in that one. So, um, so sometimes beach nourishment projects like this, they'll they'll brick, they'll take material out of a, out of a navigation channel or out of an inlet, and it's sort of like constant recyclable, recharging source. But these, unfortunately, are, are finite resources. So that's. When you think in terms of you know 20 years or 30 years of planning, that's certainly something that, that, that needs to be considered. Great, thank you. Sure. Other questions? I actually have quite a few. I don't want to throw the meeting off. I think some may be for you and may, some may be for the other gentlemen. Sure. So we can do it at the end, but I've got a note of it. Just All right. Um, well, I, I only have like two or three slides, so let's, let's wrap that up and then we can open it to, to everybody. Um, so in terms of, of, of cost items, um, just to give folks a little bit of familiarity with how these projects are paid for. Um, so there are certain items like mobilization and demobilization, um, surveys of the borrow area, payment and performance bonds that contractors have to get for, for projects like this, public, public uh, projects like this. So all of those, those costs that excuse me, all of the towns would be paying, those are kind of lumped into one cost. And then those costs are split evenly based on the amount of volume a certain town is placing. So let's say theoretically that number was you know, $10 million when you combine mode, demode, bond surveys, all this stuff. And uh, Kitty Hawk's cost was, or Kitty Hawk's volume represented 30% of the total for all four towns. 
you guys would pay three million of that 10 million and so forth. That's how that, that, that split is done. But then in terms of the actual sand that's being placed on your beach, you guys will pay per cubic yard of sand that, that these guys can show through surveys that have been placed on the beach uh, in tolerance, um, whatever, that, whatever that volume of sand is times a unit cost. Your particular unit cost is $8.50 per cubic yard. So for every cubic yard of sand they get in place on the beach, they get paid $8.50 per cubic yard. So that's how that works. Um, and then part of their contract also includes uh, the sand fencing that we talked about. Um, something that's a little different than what we did in the 2017 project is that there's a survey that for the 2017 project, our firm actually did what we call a post-construction survey. So these guys, as soon as the sand is placed, um, at any given station along the beach as they go, they're going to survey in to show that they built what they were supposed to build. And that's how we base their, their pay volume off of that survey. But at the end of the project, we want, a, and, and that, that survey doesn't have to go all the way out into you know, 20, 25 feet of water. It just has to capture the extent of where they actually place sand. But in order for us to monitor these projects from year to year to year to year, we need to know, we need to be able to compare what the beach looked like when it was constructed to year one, year two, year three, which means we have to survey all the way out into deeper water. And so the, in 2017, our firm did that survey after all four of the towns were done. We did that survey in, in December and that was kind of our baseline survey. Well, what we wanted to do was get that original baseline survey closer to when the project was actually completed. So since they have surveyors on site during their project, what we've done is built it into their contract that when a particular town is done being constructed, within two weeks of that project being finished, their surveyors will go out and do that initial baseline survey. So within two weeks of Kitty Hawk's project being done, their surveyors will go out there and they'll lock that that initial baseline survey in place. And then every year when our firm comes in and does the monitoring, we'll be able to compare it to that particular survey that was done immediately after your project was constructed. Whereas in 2017, Duck was the first project that was finished. It was finished like in, in towards the end of June, but that first survey wasn't done until December. So like six months had gone by for that duck project. And we factored that in, but it would be, it, it's, it's a better arrangement to have that data immediately after construction. So that's how we're gonna do it this go round. And then there's other options, there's other items in there that if things come up, you know, at least we have costs for those. That's just good, good common practice. Um, this is just a graphic that shows you know, some of the detail of the specifications that, 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 that these folks have to build to. So we talked about that plus six foot um, dry sand beach. They, there's a tolerance out there. You know, they don't have to build it to exactly six feet. There's a tolerance of plus six, six inches and minus six inches. So as long as that dry sand beach is within half a foot either way, um, we would consider that meeting the specification, but if they start piling sand up above that, that plus half of a foot and there's sand that's actually outside of that, that fill template, then they wouldn't be eligible for payment of that particular amount, that particular volume of sand. So every time they do those surveys, they provide those to us. We run quality control checks on those and we come to an agreement to make sure that the sand is, is, uh, is placed within spec. Um, a lot of people are interested in um, you know, what, what could the potential environmental impacts be on projects like this. Uh, everybody's familiar with sea turtles. Um, and so one of, the, one of the requirements of a project like this is that um, in terms of coordinating with the contractor, they, they are allowed to work 24 hours a day within their, within their construction zone. But if for some reason they have to go outside of that construction zone, um, they, they cannot go outside of that construction zone until the beach has been cleared in the morning or if there's some sort of an emergency where something has to move out of the way. There's an actual nighttime monitor that will be inside the construction zone with them, watching everything, seeing if 
you know, if by chance a turtle came up into the actual construction zone and wanted to nest in that area, that person would have the authority to let them know and say, you know, we have to stop. This is what has to happen. You have to shut down if you're within 500 feet of the, the active construction zone. Um, all that sort of thing, but the, the, that person could also potentially escort, you know, the, the the construction crew if for some reason they had to go outside of it. But um, there's a lot of lot of turtle monitoring on the beach. There's actually uh, there's also a, a monitor that's on board all of the dredges that'll be operating out there. So those are they're, they're called endangered species observers. Um, they'd be trained to spot, you know, a, a specific whale that might be an endangered species or a sea turtle or anything like that. And there are procedures that if those animals get within a certain distance of the vessel that they have to try to maneuver and, and, uh, and avoid any sort of um, a adverse impact to those, those animals. Uh, and then one other thing that, that's a little bit new this, to this project this year is that the, the permitting agencies have required benthic monitoring to take place. So benthic organisms would be like the coquina clams or the mole crabs or the worms and stuff that are actually in the sand moving around. And the, the science behind what happens to those organisms during a beach nourishment project, it, it's pretty well established science. It's almost kind of surprising that the agencies have asked for this. They, they did not ask for it in 2017. Uh, I think Nags Head may have had to do it in one of their previous projects, but for whatever reason, this go round, they've asked us to do a monitoring, uh, a monitoring uh, plan. And so <clears throat> directly prior to the sand being placed on the beach, we'll, we will sample individual locations that are shown in these blue stars on the map. Um, immediately after the sand has been placed, we'll sample those areas the same way. And then a year after the project has been constructed, we'll come back and sample those same spots again. And then we also have three, three control areas that are you know, well outside of wherever sand will be placed. But essentially what's going to happen is they, they'll, they'll take a scoop of sand off of the beach and they'll sift it through a certain size sieve to get most of the sand out. And all you're really left with are the organisms, and they'll take those organisms and put them into formalin or formaldehyde, something like that, and they'll provide them to a biologist that can literally identify every sort of species that's in there, and they'll, they'll graph that. They'll say, this is how many were in this location uh, prior to the project, this is how many were in the, there directly after the project, and then a year later, this is how many were there. And what we would expect to see is that um, those organisms recolonize themselves within a year or two after these projects. That's pretty typical of, you know, everything from the Gulf, the Gulf Coast to you know Florida to North Carolina up to you know the Northeast. It's it's pretty well established that that's how these organisms recolonize these areas. Um, so that is part of the the contract as well. Um, so let's talk real quick about schedule. Um, the, the last schedule that was released to the Dare County, um, the Dare County More Beaches to Love website had the project beginning in Kitty Hawk and then going to Kill Double Hills and then Southern Shores and then Duck. Since these guys have been down here and, and, you know, for the last week or so and they're starting to look at these accesses and they're reevaluating the equipment that they have available, um, what, <clears throat> what they've informed us of just literally over the last, last day is that most likely they are going to mobilize in the southern part of Kill Double Hills and try to build the Kill Double Hills project first. And so the Kill Double Hills project at this point would be something like early June is when the, the project would start. Going into early July, it's, uh, it's anticipated about 35 days of construction for Kill Double Hills. Then in early July, they would move into Kitty Hawk, starting from the south, going to the north. Um, they would finish that up sometime in mid-August. It's about 40 days anticipated for construction. Then they would go into Southern Shores, and then they would finish up in the town of Duck. So that's kind of new information. We'll probably get up with, um, with Dare County sometime tomorrow and provide this new information to them so that they can update them more beaches to love. Uh, schedule, but for, for those of you that are here tonight or watching, um, that's the latest and greatest schedule um, that we have available at this point in time. Uh, so the last slide, just moving forward, you know, what happens at this point in time? Well, the first thing that's going to happen is that about six weeks prior to these guys starting construction of the Kitty Hawk project, we're going to have to do a pre-construction survey of the entire beach. 
Those will be beach profiles that go all the way out to that deep water that I talked about, but they're on 500 foot spacings. So they will provide all of that data to, to, to Adam and I, and we will kind of reshuffle the deck, redistribute the sand, provide them an updated drawing, and uh, all of that stuff will, will probably start happening in the next month or so. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, construction is uh, tentatively scheduled for about 40 days from early July to mid-August. Um, and then uh, the, the town will be monitored. Um, the initial post-construction survey that we talked about two weeks following completion of the sand placement and then continued annual monitoring once the project is completed. <clears throat> Just like the 2017 project, this project was designed for uh, anticipating a five-year design life. So obviously all of that will be evaluated as we go along and, and coordinate with the other towns to look at um, you know, whatever future projects might be needed. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take questions. And, and yeah, th that's why these guys are here as well. Um, we can, they, they're, they're certainly available to answer questions. Dave? Um, I'll try to make it kind of brief. At the beginning of the presentation, you had an area like, say, for Southern Shores, and you saw this scale that dropped going back into Kitty Hawk. Um, I think it was one of the first slides you did. Yep. Oh, yeah. Southern Shores. All right. Does that, it, it, it might have been before that, but it, that, that's okay. That's good enough. Does that, separation create like some type of cross current underneath like a little inlet to pull sand away from kitty off to southern shores or vice versa no i mean the the transition the transition i mean we won't know exactly what that what that differential is until we get that final survey data and see what the condition of the beaches in southern shores and kitty Hawk. but it's probably you know it, it, it's it's going to be it it would be tough to see the difference if you were out there walking on the beach, but um, you know what what they will actually do is they'll transition. If I was walking straight down the edge of where the slope of the beach was, kind of like this, mm -hmm. and I mean it would be like a gentle you know just starting to walk in a in a diagonal path as opposed to straight. It'd be and, hard to see that transition. And I'm speaking more offshore. Offshore, I mean things. I'm not speaking about that. Yeah, once, once you get into the once you get into the water, that that process would or that that situation would be even more smoothed out because the wave energy that's constantly reacting to this. Mm -hmm. All of these guys are trying to do is <clears throat> hit a particular slope, and they know that they have to get that sand down to a particular intersection point on a particular slope. And so they're just you know, they're just pushing that sand out to that point. But literally the next day, if you went out there and surveyed it, it would look a little bit different because as soon as you put that sand in the water, it's starting to spread. It's starting to move around. Um, so I would I would say it would be pretty it would be pretty equally distributed out there um, underneath of the water, all, almost immediately. Um. Jump around a couple of different. That's okay. uh, what do we do about making sure there's no fuel spillage from an environmental standpoint on the beaches? You want to talk a little bit about this safety protocol? And yeah, I mean, you know, you know, you know, I don't know how good that microphone will pick, up, pick you up back here. Oh, uh, I would say for fuel, for the most part, we'll have a larger tank that's stationed at a particular access. I mean, we're designated here to a couple of y'all's area. Then we'll have uh, double wall tanks. All of our tanks are double wall. They meet, you know, Army Corps specs, so that's what we're generally uh, used to, you know, abiding by. Um, and we'll use those in our site. Uh, we also have a, a company called O'Brien's that we use for any kind of spill containment and things like that. Uh, all of our fuel tanks have a spill containment kit that goes along with them, you know, something was to happen. So that's our basic protocol, I guess, for that. So. Um, just a couple more quick ones for me. <clears throat> you guys have talked about how you're quarantining the beach from a safety standpoint. What do you do to keep kayakers and paddle boarders from coming from the north or the south and into that area? Generally speaking, if we had something like that that was in the water that we couldn't deal with ourselves, we would probably enlist the, the help of uh, you 
you know, lifeguards, you know, Coast Guard, if it was that serious of an issue. Uh, I haven't had a lot of that personally. Uh, you know, we had, you know, surfers be a problem at, at different times, you know, kind of in the area. Um, I, I've seen that before. And generally, with the help of the lifeguards, you know, or, or you know, even the law enforcement in the town. Oh, sure. Really help us with that. Um, yeah, typically, those people that would be like the guards on either side. I mean, you know, if they saw somebody like that was that was close to coming up on the beach, I mean, they'd probably be yelling at that person before they stepped on dry land that like you can't be here, you gotta go back away. Um, I think at White Street we had kind of like a double sand fencing done last time. I think it kind of right around that White Street area. I seem to remember coming off of, of that access before. Um, you, you talked earlier about <clears throat> maybe getting with some folks, Willie or whoever, trying to figure out where the best staged at. Um, what, do you, how do you feel the effectiveness of that worked last time? Um, I know, I, I feel like the area in White Street, that, that forward dune, held pretty well. Um, I, I've been curious about if there if there really is a low spot in between the the you know the, the the original dune and that new dune to try to fill that that gap in a little bit. Um, the other thing I'd say is like we probably want to consider where there's vegetation. We ne we don't necessarily want to cover up. You know, the, a lot of people put a lot of effort into trying to vegetate some of those areas. So it would be kind of like spot checking that and that vegetation. Like once. There, there will be significantly more sand out there over those first two winters that'll be blowing around the same sand that you know, built up that starter dune pretty well. And so if there is vegetation in those areas in between, you know, that's gonna catch some sand and help build up that elevation as well. But if it's just dry sand back in, in that low spot, I think that would be a, a, a decent place to try to, to try to stack some of that. Um, to try to stack some of that. The, the sand fencing. The, the permitting agencies themselves, um, we got some comments back about, you know, one of the things they don't, their assumption is that these beaches are always going to erode all the way back to where they started before the project was built. Um, I think sometimes that idea of you know, building the design and then putting advanced fill out in front and trying to always hold that design out there. Um, you know, they, they think of it in terms of, all right, you built this beach, but now it's eroded all the way back. And you built this beach, and now it's eroded all the way back. Um, and so they don't, they don't like the idea of encroaching that dune further and further out onto the beach, because they feel like at the end of the day, when it's eroded back to where it was before, all you have is a dune. And that's, that doesn't really provide any habitat for, you know, nesting sea turtles or anything like that. So they really... They really push us to try to keep that dune as far back as possible, and they even had some comments this go round about like trying to fill in the sand in those low areas between the two dunes and things like that. So, I think if we can if we can try to work on areas where it makes sense to get that sand fencing in there and build that elevation up, um, you know that that might support our case. You know the next time we go through that cycle and showing that it's not it's not so much of a depression anymore. Okay. That's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Other questions? Jeff? No, I don't have any. Charlotte? I'd like to know how, what is the average lifespan of your bulldozers? <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we deal with this all the time, and I can't imagine having something in that surf. They probably won't be on this job from the last job. I'll say a few years would be 1,500 hours. I'm just wasn't very technical, but uh, I need to know. Questions, Counsel? Ken? All right. I think we're I think we're good. Very informative. Uh, I'm glad you let us know, Charlotte. I'm sure you I'm thrilled. Happy about the change in time. I'm spent. thrilled about the cotton mine. Uh, Thank you. So uh but great, I think we're, we don't want to rush time, but I think we're all excited to see this happen and get it over with. And the public has been asking, uh, I know you're asking me, I think a lot of us, hey, when is it gonna start? They're excited about it too. So if you can move it up, that's fine too. All right. All right. <laughs> well, the, 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 for me, I, one, of the, one of the things that, uh, you know, the last go round, um, you know, the, the month of September was a pretty rough month. 
So these guys are well aware that the further they get into into the fall, they want to be done as fast as possible. <laughs> yeah. so, um, they just, whatever they can do with their other contract uh, you know, commitments and, and trying to get out, I know, I know they want to get it done as fast as anybody wants to. Very good. All right. I got one more question. Sure. Um, you one just mentioned more. a, a uh, sorry, you mentioned a uh, schedule change, and you still kind of been working that out. Um, you said possibly coming soon, uh, and the reason I'm asking just because you know, we, several companies have already got a lot of information out to our visitors that are coming, just to try and manage expectations. Sure. So, he you know, he just gave you the time frame earlier. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I saw that. Um, I said that there was going to be maybe a, a change to that proposed schedule. I mean, there. We we. I mean, we kind of joke around. Like we we will, we'll always try to provide the most updated information. But the next line, anytime you tell somebody about the schedule, should always be this is completely sure. subject to change. Ten. This could change tomorrow. This could change. So, I mean, it's good information to have. But like, how how far do you want to do to plan? Like. The idea of trying to, you know, book certain weeks, I mean, it's, oh. it's a little bit crazy. Like, I mean, there's just no way of, of, of predicting that sort of thing. So, um, I mean, we've had a lot of these discussions, you know, with the other towns. They, they understand, you know, how much people want to have that information. And they understand the gravity of, like, putting that information out there. And once it's out there, you change it. But, I mean, they, right now, they feel pretty comfortable. It makes sense with the equipment that they have lined up to bring here. Um, and, the, uh, and, and the order and the access points and things like that, they feel pretty comfortable that at least the order of the work is going to be Kittle Hills, Kitty Hawk. You know, weeks could, you know, the weeks, not weeks marine, but the weeks could go backwards, <laughs> they could go forward. Um, but the order seems to be, you know, pretty well established. Everything's subject to change. Good question. Good question. All right, any, anybody else? Ken, thank you all very much for being You're here very tonight. Welcome. Great very job, great present presentation, and, and we're excited. Awesome. Thank awesome. you, guys. All right. Andy, you have anything? No, other than we've uh, we have ordered some additional sand mats yeah. for some of the accesses. Good. So we used Good. some money out of beach nourishment, so that all protect our dunes. Good. Board, so That's we'll, good. We'll work on getting hopefully all the major accesses. We'll have those sand mats down to. The beach. Trying not to plant some more new parking lots are. <laughs> so we don't destroy. Yeah. Very comfortable for your feet. I know that. All right, Council, I need a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. second. Lynn, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.